The COP26 summit is on in Glasgow and a lot of people are confused. This summit is being seen as one of the last major sessions where we can maybe reverse the impact of climate change, where we can maybe substantially do something about it. But a lot of terms are being thrown about. You have net zero, you have numbers such as 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius. What exactly do all these numbers mean and what is the impact likely to be? We'll be discussing this on Mapping Fault Lines. We have with us Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so like I said, a lot of uh, confusion generally about what is a very important issue which all of us have a role to play. So I'm going to actually start by taking one of those terms which, there, which has come in the discussions quite often, which is the idea of carbon space itself. So could you maybe start by taking us through what exactly carbon space is and what is the impact actually that it has concretely? Well, you know, it starts from understanding what are the greenhouse gases? And when the concentration of greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, which are the ones which take max, which create maximum amount of impact? And how do we actually measure what is the effect it is having on us, on the atmosphere? And how much time do we have? How do you compute this? So if we look at the various greenhouse gases, methane is one, nitrous oxide is another, and of course carbon dioxide, which is the most talked about. The difference between other greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide is apart from the fact it is produced much more than others, is the fact it has a long atmospheric life. Now com computing this life is a little tricky because it has different ways of removing it. Chemically, it does not decompose into anything further. So it just gets taken out differently. So I'm not going to go into that, but there's anything between 300 to 500 years is the half-life of carbon dioxide, according to various experts. And if you compare to, say, methane, it's only about 10 years, which is the half-life of methane. That's why we focus on carbon dioxide much more. And when you talk of carbon space, it comes from really carbon dioxide, because you talk about how much space do we have for emitting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere till we reach a point where a certain number of degrees of Celsius, as you said, will become inevitable. So right now we have been talking about limiting it to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And That's that- That's 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, that increase. Pre-industrial revolution, pre-industrial levels, which means that over the last 100 years, we would have seen some increase because already there is an accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And how much more can we afford before, in fact, we have a civilizational impact or a collapse, depending on how much it heats up. Now, all of these are open to, of course, debates, but there's no question. We have been seeing a steady rise in average atmospheric, te average temperature on the surface of the globe. And that at the moment is visible that our mean temperatures in summer have been rising, particularly in certain areas more than others. And if we take all of that, we get also the unfortunate differentiated impact of climate change, that the temperature rises in the uh, global south, so to say, which is really the equatorial or tropical regions, is probably going to be higher in the colder climates that we have, the north and global, you know, deep south of the near the poles and so on. So the temperate areas may see less of climate change in terms of temperature rise than what we have as a equatorial and tropical areas, which already have high temperatures, there the temperature is likely, rise is likely to be even higher. Right, so what we see by these numbers is that we have about, uh, by, by 2021 today, we have about, I think, 14% uh, left, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, if we see the graphic, which is here, you will see that starting with about X number of greenhouse gases that we could have emitted, we successively, as the centuries, I will not say centuries, because most of the rise has been really post-1950. If you see that, you will see that slowly we have gone up, taking out for 1.5 degrees centigrade, what is the amount of carbon that we have to emit? 
And if we take that, we will see that we have already exhausted the existing carbon space we had, say post 1850, 1750, whatever time you take it because those time periods the emissions were really small mm. but you will see it accelerates really after 1950 and by now we have only 14 percent of the carbon space which we had at that time which is available to us that means that whatever we have emitted we can only emit 14 percent of that today if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And with the rate of emissions we are doing, that doesn't seem likely at all. Right. The What is called the degree of ambition we have shows that we have almost exhausted our possibility. Because even if we stop, you know, everything, say, within the next five, seven years, we'll still probably take up most of that 14%. So what you're really looking at is the fact that 1.5 degree seems to be unrealistic at the moment, given the ambitions that the particularly the developed countries have shown trying to con, you know, contain their carbon emissions. And we are really looking at a two degree rise, which even if we achieve that would be something which is quite remarkable. <clears throat> the ambitions at the moment do not seem to show that we are going to be achieve that. So we might end up by being in the two to three degree range, which would really make life or civilization as we know it in the world much more difficult. Absolutely. Prabhupada, in this context, there's also been a lot of discussion about methane. In fact, I think recently there was an agreement that, you know, there's going to be a cut down on methane emissions. So as part of this agree, as part of this COP26, of course. So what role exactly does methane play? You hinted at it earlier. But when compared to carbon dioxide, why is there so much focus on methane? Well, this seems to have again crept up. This was an old, uh, well, I say red herring that came up in climate change discussions. Methane is a short-lived gas. In 10, 10 years, it decays to carbon dioxide again. And this 10 years, yes, it has a high impact, but it doesn't stay in the atmosphere. So it gets taken out. So that does not therefore pose the kind of dangers as carbon dioxide does, which stays in the atmosphere for much longer periods. Now, methane, of course, is also appearing because you use natural gas. Some of it is flared. Some of it is just goes into the atmosphere, the leakages, the pipelines, and so on. But a big part of the methane comes essentially to what are called uh, cows, emitting gas. You may laugh at it because farting is essentially the target. So feedstock or raising uh, cows for the table and the table is really in the global north while the cows may be raised in the global south. Yes. So therefore the global south is being blamed for producing too much of cow emissions and also agriculture particularly rice and paddy cultivation. So these are supposed to be also where methane is produced. Now the question again is if we take sum up all of this in terms of the global change in terms of temperature, these are not the major factors. So why are they raised? Because it's a red herring for industrial or shall we call the developed countries to raise because it is attacking essentially countries like India, China and of course those in Latin America which raise a lot of uh, cattle, beef and so on. So I think this is the way to divert attention from the real responsibilities they have with carbon emissions and trying to therefore sidetrack into something which the IPCC never took as a major target. Right. So, Prabir, you mentioned, of course, the responsibility of countries. And now that's, of course, an uh, argument which has been a lot of discussion around that. You know, there are all these debates about which are the major emitters. So, for instance, if you look at this map, which is 2019 numbers, it shows the biggest emitters in the world. Now, I think many people, especially in the global south, have argued that this is not really the sort of way to look at emissions. And you can't take, say, one year's emissions or in isolation because it's a much longer process. So, could you tell us a bit more about how to understand a map like this when we see, okay, India, for instance, major emitter, has to do a lot, uh, is causing a lot of global warming and climate change. How exactly do we understand this? Well, there are two axes to this discussion, as you rightly said. <coughs> One is when you talk about a large emitter, are we talking about the, also the population? Because ultimately, a country which is very small compared to, say, for instance, China or India, may appear to be emitting much less. United Kingdom has a population of something like 60, 65 million. 
and you're talking about 1.5 billion uh, in China, 1.3 billion in, um, in India. And then you say, you know, India is a very big emitter. So it does not really take <coughs> into account the sizes of the countries. And therefore, of course, if you take European Union, which at least has a population which is not as big as India and China's, but at least not as small as the United Kingdom or France, then you will see, of course, it is also a big emitter. Why is it a big emitter? Because the per capita emissions of these countries are relatively high. So when you talk about India and you scale it down, not to the annual emission, but per capita emissions, or you take what you said earlier, also the cumulative emissions. You don't take what we are doing right now, because for a long time, India and China did not emit too much of carbon dioxide. But you take the cumulative emissions, then you will see that India and China's proportion as cumulative emissions is much less than that of other countries, developed countries, like the European Union or like the United States, Canada, and so on. So I think these are the different things that you have to take into account. And I think the most important part of it is why in the Kyoto Protocols, it was said we have to take historical emissions into account and therefore there was a, what is called a different common but differentiated responsibility. Yes, all of us put together own have the responsibility for what happens in the, uh, in the atmosphere, the world carbon emissions, or greenhouse gases and so on. But we have differentiated responsibility because historically, we are not the ones who created the problem. Therefore, those historically who have created the major part of the problem, and let's face it, the major emissions have taken place post 1950. We are not talking of 1850, we are not talking of 1750, but really, even if you take 1950, most of these emissions have taken place after 1950. So historically, countries who knew jolly well what they were doing should take a bigger part of the responsibility. They're also richer. Therefore, their capability of doing it is also more. Their need, therefore, to fund those who are coming much later in the development cycle is also more. But what we see is a kind of policing approach in which you say, no, everybody has to bear up the same responsibility irrespective of historical emissions. Let's only look at what the current emissions are and see what we can do for the future. Let's not talk about the past. So this is, of course, trying to justify what is called grandfathering. You grab property and you sit on it. Of course, in this case, what you've grabbed is atmospheric uh, commons, which is the the global commons we have, in which you have emitted more carbon dioxide. You'll say, hey, now it's limiting, it's, uh, it's getting to its limit, so you guys have to stop. We all need to stop, but at the same pace. But at the same time, the ability for each of these countries are very different, and even that's not being addressed. Exactly, Prabhu. This brings us to the other point, which is, of course, that emissions is one way of seeing it, I think, like you pointed out earlier. But emissions per se don't really make any sense when we don't think of what these emissions are. And at the end of the day, these emissions are people leading their lives, people working, people, you know, commuting, people being people. So how do we understand this from a concept of uh, energy consumption as well, and then see the discussions that are taking place? So that's a very important point that you raise when you talk about emissions per capita emissions, say. Then per capita emissions also show or should be related to per capita energy consumption because in most of these cases, except hydroelectric energy, what you are using is really uh, fossil fuels. You are using gas, oil, or coal. All of these are fossil fuels. Nuclear has become extremely expensive. We, we are not going to get into that today, but as a long-term solution to the problem of uh, energy, it certainly does not appear to be in the offing. So unless we crack something which is fusion or something else, we don't seem to be in a nuclear path. So given that, you're either looking at fossil or renewables. Now, when you talk about fossils, what we are seeing is, of course, the fossil fuels are converted to energy. Now, they're concentrated sources of energy. That means you can get a lot of energy from a kg of coal or a kg of oil. But when you come to solar energy, it's much more diffused energy. So you need to concentrate it first, and that is used to be expensive. But with the advances we have made, we are, our costs have come down. But nevertheless, there is one big problem, that it, 
it is not, it doesn't depend on us. We don't control it. The sun comes, unfortunately, it doesn't shine 24 hours. And winter and summer also there is a difference. Wind, it doesn't again depend on us. Germany this time didn't get proper winds. It had to burn more coal. So what do we do therefore is because we need energy. Therefore, we have fossil fuel which we burn. And as you said rightly, the issue is not carbon emissions, but it's really about energy entitlements. And if we want energy entitlements of the people to be met, then if we don't allow them to use fossil or we want them to cut down on the fossil fuels, we need to have two things. One is find an intermediate path which cuts down coal, for instance, and increases energy consumption, but also has some greenhouse emissions. Europe said that they need gas for that. They are in fact saying gas and oil is our intermediate path. But at the same time, when it comes to Africa, Norway recently, recently has, moved, uh, has moved that financial institutions after 2025 should not give any money to African countries for producing gas because that is a greenhouse issue. So here you are that Nordic countries can use gas. They in fact want to expand their gas but not Africa. So what you are talking about is really taking away people's ability to use energy or generate energy which would have some carbon emissions if it was equitably done. Those who are rich have already got the benefits of development. They have built their infrastructure, would spend more money and subsidize also other countries to, so that at least they could have an intermediate path of using maybe gas and oil like they themselves are claiming for, the, for their countries. On the other hand, you have also the United States, which when it comes to coal, you have recently Manchin who, who is who say coal. So you are seeing that the advanced countries or the developed countries are basically asking others to cut down, but are not willing to cut down or follow the same principles themselves. What it means is that you want to lock the rest of the world who have not, who have not developed as much as you have, unlike China, which has pulled up quite a bit. Even countries like India, which are still way below in terms of per capita consumption energy, lock them in a low development stage. Right. India, for instance, consumes one twelfth per capita energy that the United States does. So it's a long way off from energy equity. And the question of global equity in climate change is also connected to global equity in terms of energy consumptions. And I must say one last word before I uh, leave this topic that United States has been historically the biggest emitter. It, I think, takes 20% of the total carbon space that the world has already lost. And it is no longer treaty capable. Right. You have, uh, well, you had Clinton who signed the Kyoto Protocol, who agreed to the Kyoto Protocol. George Bush walked out of it. You have, after that, Obama, Paris Agreement, Trump walked out of it. Biden today, who doesn't have probably a majority in the Senate and might lose the Congress, if not the presidency, again to a Trumpian kind of figure, again they will pull out of the climate change agreement. So what we have is, while pressure on the other countries mount, you have the key uh, culprit, if I may say so, in climate change, does not accept any, uh, any uh, agreement and is probably not capable of reaching an agreement. So this COP26 that we see, after two years, what we will see as far as the role of the United States is concerned, is very much open to question. Right, Prabir. Thank you so much for speaking to us. We'll come back next week as well with more on this as well as the agreements that were reached and see if our collective futures can be saved. Keep watching News Click. Bye.